Chico Iyer is well known for his amazing travel books, which is why he is a hard man to track down or keep still. He is a restless seeker who has lived a peripatetic life, some of which is inspired by a rather famous now departed English writer who lives in his head. It is my pleasure to welcome Pico Iyer and Graham Greene to Studio Four to tell us more. <laughs> Lovely to be here again. And I gave the secret away. It is uh, English writer Graham Greene who lives in your head or lived in your head. Lives, I'd say, and there are lots of people kicking around in my head, but mm -hmm. he's the one who casts the most unsettling spell and who sort of possesses me so that half the time I wonder if I'm just a figment of his imagination. Everywhere I go around the world, I seem to be walking through a Graham Greene novel. Mm. Um, and you say he knows you better than you know yourself at times, and you know him so well. Yes. I think that's part of the strangeness of reading, which is you pick up a book, you read for maybe eight hours, and you descend so deeply into so another person that you come to know his most intimate terrors and guilts and secrets the way you never know those of your own parents, for example. Him knowing me is stranger, but I will read a book, and I will know what the character's going to say or do ten pages later, so it seems, and so it transpires. So that's mm. mysterious kind of affinity, I think. Mm -hmm. And as oh. you point out, uh, blood relatives are not always uh, <laughs> our closest friends. No. They're not. No. And I think everybody has somebody in their head. It could be a singer or a figure out mm -hmm. of history or a figure out of fiction, but somehow you feel that um, they understand you as nobody else does. And when did you begin to believe that? And why? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe especially when I was traveling. And I remember, for example, once I was in this little hotel in Santiago de Cuba called the Hotel Casa Grande. And I walked out and I got into a car to look around. And as soon as I did, a stranger slipped into the passenger seat, promised to show me around, which is disconcerting. More disconcerting when he said his name was Faust. Most disconcerting <laughs> when I returned to California a few years later when I was reading a biography of Graham Greene and I found that 35 years before that, Graham Greene had been in Santiago de Cuba. He'd stayed in the same little hotel. He'd stepped outside one day, got into a car to look around. A stranger had slipped in and promised mm -hmm. to show him around. And again and again, things like that would happen. I would read about him making confession to a priest called Father Pilkington. And I would remember that the man who was in charge of my spiritual welfare, my housemaster when I was at school, was a priest called Father Pilkington. Not a very common name, and, no. and many more things like that. Mm. And uh, mm. Green, I understand from you, from reading your book, was not into rich or powerful, but into becoming more real. And he embraced kindness and mm. humanity. Mm. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yes, he embraced kindness, I think, more than doctrine. He thought what you do is more important than what you believe or mm -hmm. don't believe. And humanity, almost he had more faith in that than in God. He claimed to be a Catholic who didn't believe in God. But in his books, you always, as you remember, have those very fallen, conflicted, sinning characters mm -hmm. who in the moment of need rise to an act of kindness or self-sacrifice that could put a priest to shame. And he often had a character named Henry. <laughs> yes. Why Henry? Did Be you figure that out? I did, because Henry was actually his real name. He was Henry Graham Greene. And it's interesting that the Henrys in his books are always very mousy, timid characters. So I think mm -hmm. that spoke for one part of him, and Graham maybe for another. Tell me about your beginnings, your roots. Uh, interesting life you've had so far. Uh, England, mm -hmm. India, England, dad a Rhodes Scholar, mm -hmm. dad an academic, a colorful man, yes. like colorful chairs. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. colorful cars, painted our house yellow, but yes, very charismatic figure. Is that the house of the balcony blew off in California? <laughs> yes, yes. That's the house? Yes, you remember the book well, that's right. And then the house that later burnt down. Yes, um, the, in the horrible fires in Santa that's Barbara. Right, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, and again, it was one of those things that I remember as a relatively young person reading how Graham Greene had a terror of seeing his house burn down, which mm. is an odd thing if you're growing yeah. up in quiet suburban England. But during the Blitz in World War II, his house did burn down when he was in his 30s. And then when I was in my 30s, I was walking up the stairs in my parents' house in California. Suddenly I noticed we were surrounded by 70-foot flames and our house burnt down. Well, what was the transition for you? Mm from England, <laughs> yes, you know, proper, <laughs> yes. Uh, a little boarding school here or there and a right. uniform, to mm. Southern California. <laughs> a shock? A, sh a huge shock. Mm. I'm still recovering 40 years later. Uh, and I don't know what that transition was about, but when I was seven, my parents did move from Oxford, where I was born and grew up, to Santa Barbara, California. 
And of course, this was California in the 60s. The students down the road were burning down the Bank of America, mm -hmm. really raising to the ground all the foundations of society as we knew it. And then I, I started commuting back and forth between California in the 60s and 15th century boarding school in England. You missed those masters and those old boys at boarding <laughs> school, did you? I did. Well, I won't say I missed them, but I will say even at the age of nine, I thought, well, this is a little tumultuous for a little kid of nine. I'm maybe safer with the devil I know than this devil that I don't mm. know. And going back to California, like being on Mars? A little yes. Bit. And also, Must have been. Also the envy of all my friends, because most mm. of little boys in England in the 60s and 70s had one dream in life, and that was to be a Californian. So I was able to play the exotic card mm -hmm. and say, yeah, of course. I'm holidaying in the city of your dreams, or the land of your dreams. Yes, as you still do, occasionally. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, back to Graham <clears throat> Greene, uh, his books, his most famous book, uh, well, his first book called the Man Within. Exactly. Hence my book, The Man Within My Head. Uh, and so his first book was about, I suppose, the dividedness he felt within himself, almost mm. as if Jekyll and Hyde were fighting it out for control of his soul. And as I began writing about Graham Greene and these imaginary fathers we create in our heads, I was thinking, why do we create them in response to the real fathers who created us? So mm. I began to go back and forth between Graham Greene and my father in my head. And so I began to wonder who is the real man within my head. Maybe it's my father, not Maybe Graham Greene. Maybe it is. Mm. Uh, how is, was <coughs> Graham Greene similar to your father? He might have been the opposite. In other words, I associate my father with California in the 60s and revolution and mm. explosion and bright colors, as you said. And Graham Greene is the kind of apostle of the 15th century damp English boarding <laughs> school. So I was almost going back and forth between mm. their rival influences every mm -hmm. three months as a, as a little boy. Your shadow yeah. personality, perhaps. Yes, I don't know which is the shadow and which no, is the light. Exactly. <laughs> who's the dark one and who's the light one? Well, your dad, who was, a, as I said, a, a, a scholar, and loved colors and obviously loved life and imparted great knowledge to you, mm. yes? Yes, absolutely. So he was probably the figure of light. And it's interesting that Graham Greene too, when he was 16, his father was a teacher also. In fact, his father was headmaster of the school Greene was going to. So Greene tried to run away from that school. Mm -hmm. He got apprehended, but his parents sent him off at 16 to live for six months with a Jungian dream analyst. And so he had these two fathers. He had this one shadowy man in the world of dreams, and he had the other who was the upstanding headmaster. And mm. that was another source of my affinity for him, mm -hmm. I think, going back and forth. And what did Graham Greene believe about writing, the purpose of writing? Why did he write? Mm. He said he couldn't understand how anybody could survive without writing, mm -hmm. a way to get your demons out of your heads and onto the page, and also a way to look unsparingly at some of the darker parts of yourself that otherwise you would not look at. Uh, and so I think writing was a form of, of, of therapy for him in some ways. Yes, The Quiet um, American, perhaps one of his most famous books. Yes, uh, written and set in, in Vietnam in the first half of the 1950s. And already in 1953, he's describing napalm bombing and CIA intrigue and American operatives, things that really didn't happen for another 10 years, mm -hmm. so it's very prophetic. And <clears throat> I would say if you read that book, written 66 years ago, uh, 56 years ago, you can see what's happening in Afghanistan next year or in Iraq mm -hmm. five years ago. Somehow, through looking very closely at how England and America operate in the world, he caught something timeless that is still playing out. And it became a movie, didn't it? It did. The Quiet um, American? It did, twice. And in fact, this is a sh sign of how prophetic he was, when the more recent movie starring Michael Caine was completed, it was screened for its producers on September the 10th, 2001, mm. and then they couldn't release it for a year and a half because three days later it was so close to the day's events and the headlines. Yes, um, to 9-11. So, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think to this day, if you want to know what's happening in the world, read The Quiet American. He also loved to write about brothels. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Tell me about that <laughs> side of him. <laughs> he was not very good with commitment, and I think sometimes he often stressed how he would go to brothels because he didn't want to, didn't wish himself on any woman, so it was easier to just have this professional mm -hmm. engagement. But I think he was much less interested in brothels than he made out to be. I think he was a bit l like a schoolboy who talks a lot about his adventures precisely because he doesn't I have see. many of them. Doesn't get any action. Exactly, they yes, say. that's Those right. Those who talk aren't getting any. Precisely. <laughs> uh, one of his friends called him a sinner monke, and mm. I think that's exactly who he was. He, he liked to pre present himself as a sinner, but deep down I think he was a very kind and innocent mm. man. He did have mistresses. 
He did. He had an English mistress, a French mistress. <laughs> he uh, did, yes. Another one, An American too. mistress. An American uh, yes. mistress. Yes, so he, he was busy. He was, mm -hmm. but not usually consecutive. Um, but it's a funny thing. He was married for 65 years, and the last 43 of them, he was alone. So, uh, And I think his great issue in life was that as soon as he found himself comfortable, he would exile himself from that comfort, whether it was a faith or a person or a country. Mm -hmm. So he was never good at sitting still with one place right. or one person. In that way, is he like you or not? Uh, yes, I think so. Not a very admirable part of myself, but I've always been restless, as you said in your introduction. I've always liked to move around. I got into that habit as a little boy going to school. And so I've made a, a commitment to my adopted home, Japan, and to my wife. I've been with her for 25 years. But when I read the Graham Greene book, I feel I can see whom I might have been mm -hmm. had I not made certain conscious decisions. And uh, that's interesting, who yes. you might have been. He's, he, he's, he trains a flashlight on parts of myself that uh, are shadowy mm -hmm. and that force me to look at them. You know, when I was reading this, I was trying to figure out who lives in my head. Yes, yes. And I still don't know. Oh, you don't? For sure. Uh. You know, mm. I think I'm, mm. I may have more than one. Well, don't we all? We all have more than one. It's interesting, I thought you might say one of the great Canadian people who's taken residence in so many heads, which is Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And I know lots of people, lots of women, who can barely listen to Joni Mitchell records because it seems to them as if she's just taken their diaries and their most intimate secrets and released yeah, them to the world. Paradise. I'm a Katie Lang fan. Maybe it's KD. I'm, yes. I'm not sure. But when we come back, let's talk about your, your late friend, Christopher Hitchens, and I can imagine the conversations you had with him about writing this very personal book. It's really a, a memoir of sorts. Mm, it reveals yes. a lot about you. Mm. And he had that Rolls Royce mind. Yes, that's the perfect way to put it, yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever meet him, but I so wanted to. Pico Iyer, our guest, The Man Within My Head, uh, his book, it's a, it's a travel book, it's a memoir, it's a meditation. Right, exactly, it's a biography. It's a biography. It's and it's, it's none a new of the genre. Yeah, I hope yes, so. Yes, you've invented a genre. Good. Okay, we'll come back.